I'm Bates Gill, the executive director of the Center for China Analysis, and I'm delighted to be the moderator for today's discussion on China at the UN General Assembly, how to read Beijing's new proposal on global governance. As many of you would have seen, last week, Beijing issued a major new proposal on what they called the reform and development of global governance. Uh, it was issued just ahead of the opening of the United Nations General Assembly, its 78th session this week. Now, uh, while much in the proposal was familiar in many of its themes, uh, I think it was different in many ways. First of all, uh, it was sweeping in its scope, uh, calling on the international community to adopt a far more multilateral, uh, equitable, and fair set of solutions in relation to global and regional security and development uh, in relation to the tolerance of different social, uh, cultural, and political systems around the world, and also in relation to the emergence of new uh, pioneering cutting edge technologies in relation to sp outer space or in relation to artificial intelligence and other new technologies. Also, this document uh, did not fall short in issuing some harsh criticism for what it termed a certain country, which I think we should understand to mean the United States, uh, for what the proposal uh, called a bullying and hegemonic behavior, among other epithets, uh, that in the proposal's view are standing in the way of progress on stability and development. So this is an important statement. Uh, it says a lot about China's international positioning about its international strategy, both now and what we can probably expect, certainly in the near to medium term. And that's why we wanted to get a much closer read on what is behind this proposal and what might it mean going forward. In particular, how are some of the key elements of this proposal, uh, such as the Global Security Initiative, GSI, the Global Development Initiative, also known as GDI, and the Global Civilization Initiative, GCI, all of which are prominently noted and mentioned and promoted in this proposal, how are they gonna work in practice going forward? And what can we expect from China in the United Nations this week and in the months and years to come, as well as in the Global South? These are two of the proposal's primary targets. Um, how do we expect China to operate within the UN and with the Global South as it tries to push forward and make more concrete the proposal's elements? And I think also importantly, we wanna talk about what this proposal is likely to portend for China's relations with the United States, uh, with the Global West more broadly, and with the international community. So that's the intention we're gonna try and cover here in the next 30 to 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm very, very pleased to say that uh, to address these questions, we have some leading experts who will unpack and provide their insights and analysis on the questions. Uh, first, very, very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Courtney Fung. Uh, Courtney is a friend, a former colleague of mine at Macquarie University, and she is currently scholar in residence with the Asia Society Australia, as well as associate professor at Macquarie University in Sydney. Welcome, Courtney. Um, we're also very, very pleased to have join us Taylor Bland, who is this year's uh, Schwartzman Fellow with the Center for China Analysis. Welcome as well to you, Taylor. Looking forward to your remarks, Courtney and Taylor. Let me start with um, Courtney first, if I may. I thought I'd just give you a chance to open up with a few comments, turn the floor over to Taylor as well. I'll have some questions as, and follow up I want to raise. And then I'm hoping we are gonna also be able to generate some interesting uh, questions, comments from our audience. Uh, please, uh, those of you watching online, go ahead and uh, use the Q&A function there 
send those questions in to us and we'll do our best to try and cover as many as we can in the time we have. So Courtney, over to you. Uh, give us your opening thoughts then on what this proposal's all about and what we can expect going forward. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Bates, for the very kind introduction and for hosting um, for this session this morning, this evening, this afternoon. So welcome everyone. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to build off your comments, Bates, about your point about this being a very expansive um, and really quite ambitious agenda for reform, um, reform and development of the global governance system. And I really do urge everyone to take you know, the five, 10 minutes it will take to scroll down and actually read this proposal. Um, I think in many ways, it's a very interesting opening because exactly as it talks about the ambition, it really is emphasizing the last 10 years that China uh, under Xi Jinping has moved away from idea now to action, from vision to reality. Um, and this real push now that China is solidifying its language and solidifying its approach to trying to verbalize and operationalize the change that it wants to see um, within the global governance system. I think it's very interesting that when we look at this document, we can think about two things. Um, one, I think given all of our interest in the last sort of 10 years over BRI, we can really note that BRI itself is not as central now in the way that China is presenting these global public goods. BRI is now one of five global public goods mentioned. So Bates has already spotlighted the Global Security Initiative, um, the Global Development Initiative, and the Global Civilization Initiative that also popped up um, and really quite sort of headline each section is really you know, weighted by one of these individual initiatives. And then moving through the document, one reference only, um, this global initiative on data security, another global public good that hasn't received as much attention despite having been floated by Beijing um, starting in September, 2020, I believe. But the combination of these documents is really building upon China's view that it is now going to be a leading reformer of the global governance system to show us a multipolar system, a United Nations that reflects today's global distribution of power, um, moving away from a US-led, Western-led order, and moving now into an order that is going to give more room to China's correct position, recognition of China's pole position in international politics. And so a lot of this language is verbalizing and trying to operationalize the broad vision for global governance in which China is really thinking about itself as a central weight. And a number of international partnerships on various functional issues can be formed. It doesn't have to be these deep built alliances or these very highly structured um, types of set agreements. If there's space to find cooperation on particular issues, so for example, on matters of green development, then states should cooperate to find win-win outcomes. If it's the case now that, you know, pushing on to human rights is going to be too much of a concern, then perhaps states can sort of step away and not have to work on those particular issues. So really this notion of there being these sort of functional issue areas um, for flexible participation, and again, in which we recognize China's lead position in providing the ideas and the impetus and the structure for how we think about global governance reform. So really this push now to sort of emphasize that China is delivering, has delivered over the last decade, ideas to action, vision to reality, um, and really trying to push that China is actually establishing what I see as a bi-states, four-states international system. Because as Bates noted, as much as we talk about you know, the Global Security Initiative or the Global Civilization Initiative, these are very, very particular terms to China. Um, the Global Civilization Initiative as much as it's applied and discussed in the context of human rights, really views human rights as common aspirations. They're not actually universal and they're not actually rights. And the emphasis on civilizational diversity, again, challenging this notion that there is a universal benchmark in which we should be trying to obtain and you know, really foster human protection and human security. So this is a very particular language, despite its very global, expansive, effusive, positive energy. Um, I think the last thing that I would just like to note as we sort of think about these things is that they really are these global public goods. They are still very broad and they're still very flexible. So a number of things that can be sort of stretched out. So if you read the Global Security Initiative's concept paper that was released in February of this year, 
it's very much focused on sort of bilateral security issues also get fit under its hat. So the Saudi-Iran peace deal, um, China's big aspirations for how it can try and bring about um, peace to the Ukraine war. Um, those matters receive more airtime. When we move into this sort of broad reform of the global governance system, you're going to see a number of multilateral topics that fit underneath this particular GSI. So again, it's sort of broad. These initiatives are flexible, um, they're ambitious, but they're also wide enough to sort of elide China's own shortfalls or questions being raised about China's own particular domestic and international record, while still again promoting China's own particular approach. So I think I'll stop there and I'll turn the floor back to Bates. Thank you. Thanks for that great opening, uh, Courtney. I was intrigued with your remarks that maybe we're gonna see the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, a bit on the wane. I, I agree with that. Although of course, next month will be the third of, uh, in a series of uh, uh, Belt and Road forums uh, in Beijing and probably in mid-October, uh, at which, uh, at least at this point, uh, Vladimir Putin is expected to attend. But that may well be the, uh, the, the final uh, swan song, potentially, uh, for the BRI. Of course, it will continue, but I think you're absolutely right that uh, in part because of the challenges and sort of uh, pushback that the BRI has faced, uh, I would expect very much uh, that the other initiatives, which are given a much higher profile in this new proposal, the security initiative, the civilization initiative, the development initiative, are going to be receiving a great deal more time, resources, energy, uh, and enthusiasm on the part of Beijing. And I want to get back to you later uh, to talk a little bit more about how that's going to work, uh, you know, how through the United Nations or other mechanisms can we expect this proposal to be advanced. But before we get there, I want to hear from Taylor. Um, Taylor, you know, this is uh, the, the opening of the UN General Assembly 78th session. I know you've been spending a fair bit of time uh, there on Turtle Bay uh, over the past few days. And so I'm um, keen to, to hear from you about, um, you know, how's this proposal playing? Um, what can we expect at the UNGA from China? Uh, in relation to uh, what the proposal is putting forward. You go ahead, please. Thank you, Bates, Courtney, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. As we all know, and Bates just said, UNGAR is currently underway and China's Vice President Hung Zheng is scheduled to speak very shortly. What exactly he will see, we don't know, but from China's release of the proposal on the reform and development of global governance last week, in conjunction with comments already made by Hun Zheng at UNGA, it does appear that there are four key areas that are very much likely to feature. The first of those is the promotion of economic growth and international development. And in this respect, China will emphasize its opposition to what it calls block mentality, trade wars, and strategic competition as examples that contradict international stability and development. And in this regard, it will center its initiatives as the way to do this. So the GDI, which centers our SDGs, or our Sustainable Development Goals, the GSI and the GCI, as well as the BRI, while also building up existing multilateral blocks like BRICS and Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And these initiatives are intended to offset the dominance of Western-led alliances and ease international pressure on China, including economic pressure. And it's also an opportunity to reinforce its support for a multipolar world order and restate its involvement with its peace brokering initiatives. The second is seeking sup secure supply chains. So technological competition, export controls and supply chain disruptions have caused persistent difficulties for China. And while we may like to think of China as a completely self-reliant country, it is very much still affected by geopolitical instability. Global supply chain disruptions were observed throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and continue as a result of the Russia-Ukraine war. And for China, this actually manifested in domestic energy insecurity. So through seeking domestic resource security, it was done at the trade-off of its climate commitments through the increased uptake and usage of discounted Russian coal. So stronger and more secure supply chains is actually a way to reduce volatility and susceptibility to geopolitical instability in this area. And through this, at UNGA, China is likely to call for more global economic openness and abandonment of trade restrictions and the need to establish more resilient global supply chains. And this is very much in line with its rhetoric against great power competition and also block mentality. 
The third is a focus on international security. And for this, it's expected that China is really going to emphasize its GSI, specifically intended to offer an alternative to US and other Western-led frameworks for global security. The GSI has actually gained momentum and is featured in many PRC diplomatic exchanges. And this is really important to note, as usually what is flagged here is very much central or pushed going forward. So the GSI itself is a new approach to eliminating the root causes of international conflict, and it looks to really focus on climate change cooperation, promoting sound interaction among world powers, settling regional disputes, and supporting the UN efforts in peacekeeping, counterterrorism, and combating transnational crime. Advancement on the GSI will take place generally in conjunction with China's desire to increase its peace brokering role in the international community, particularly through the UN. And I think it's important to note, and we'll probably get into this a little bit later, that the GSI is quite broad, but it does have the potential for operationalization, but time will really tell on this point. And the fourth is its response to climate, the climate crisis. China will emphasize its domestic achievements and its leadership in climate, especially since 2016, when former President Trump withdrew the US from the, from the Paris Agreement. And I know that Biden did rejoin in 2021, but that was a significant loss of leadership and action time. It's also expected to highlight its advancement in renewables, specifically doubling its utility scale solar and wind power, which was actually five years ahead of schedule, and reinforcing its commitments to achieving carbon peak by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. It may also call for developed countries to strengthen climate financing, especially as we approach COP28 and the operationalization of the loss and damage fund. It's also likely that China will focus more on its efforts towards biodiversity conservation, food security and water security, likely highlighting its cooperation with other multilateral organizations like the Food and Agricultural Organization, which together with China launched the South-South Cooperation Trust Fund to implement the Food Production Enhancement Action, which provides food assistance to and shared agro-tech with many countries. Of course, underscoring all of these agenda items will be a reinforcement of the need to uphold the principles of the United Nations, specifically peacekeeping and multilateralism to ensure a stable international community. With that, I'm going to leave my opening remarks there and pass it back to Bates. Well, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Taylor. Those are great, great insights, I think, on what we can expect this week coming from China and, and how that's really going to be a, a sort of uh, launching pad of, in some ways uh, for this new proposal and what we can expect then going forward from China's international engagements. You know, coming, coming out of the remarks that the both of you have made, I just had a few thoughts. Um, then I'd like to turn and, and, and dig a little bit deeper with you on a few more questions. Uh, before I get into that, let me just remind the audience one more time that uh, you're more than welcome yourselves to uh, use that Q&A function uh, on your screen and do send us any questions or comments you'd like. Uh, and once we've had a, another round of a couple questions with our speakers, we'll We'll try to get to the audience questions as well. Um, you know, first of all, uh, I recall that when the Belt and Road Initiative was first announced, and that's almost ten years to the day from today. Um, you know, many many folks dismissed it uh, for being too vague, not being very well defined, uh, not much meat on the bones. Um, clearly, that's changed. Um, now you can argue whether BRI has been ultimately an overall success or failure. Uh, but you can't argue with the fact that it uh, has, um, you know, invested, you know, nearly a trillion some dollars in something like three thousand projects, at least according to Chinese official statistics, uh, and has made an enormous impact uh, in the uh, in in the in, in economies around the world, and of course also in helping build out uh, China's profile and its connectivity and uh, and relationship building, particularly in. The global south. I think we should expect a similar set of developments to occur, um, even though the GSI, GDI, GCI, um, in some cases, have been sort of out there already for a year or two. Um, I think we're just at the very beginning of what I suspect will be a number of uh, um, activities falling within uh, these new these new initiatives, and also the, not, not to mention the, the, the data security initiative, which Courtney mentioned earlier. Already um, in the case of the uh, GSI, which is something I've been trying to follow relatively closely, uh, we see uh, that there is underway an effort to operationalize it. Um, for example, uh, the uh, Lanzhang Mekong Cooperation Framework, which is a sort of China-centric 
multilateral cooperation uh, organization which links China and the mainland Southeast Asian states um, within the uh, uh, within the Mekong River system uh, to link them together, and they've named the, uh, the this particular project, the the Lansang Mekong Cooperation Framework, as a GSI pilot program. Um, so watch that space, uh, and I think what we're going to find there are intensified activities on China's part to link with security forces, police forces, uh, border uh, patrols, et cetera, uh, to try and introduce you know, China's uh, version of security in that region with its uh, Southeast Asian neighbors, all under the rubric of this uh, GSI. Um, let's let's uh, though move on from there for the moment, and I'd like to dig in more deeply with you um, Courtney, on some of the things that you mentioned earlier, um, um, I'm, I'm quite keen. You're you're really uh, the world's leading expert now, following uh, how China operationalizes its interests within the UN system. You know, you you had the excellent book on China's uh, you know approach to security and non proliferation, uh, non non uh, non an intervention uh, within the international system, and how that got operationalized through the UN. Um, you're in a great position, I think, to judge how these new global initiatives, as they've been promoted under the new proposal, how, how does it work? How does China operationalize these uh, in, within the UN system? Great. Thanks, Bates. Um, I, think, I think there's a couple of mechanisms. Um, you know, we can take the GSI, for example. It's, it's a very particular type of... Um, initiative in the sense that, and I think you and I would be in agreement on this, that it's a very bold move for China to be putting a security footing first, um, in the sense that we can look at decades of the way that China's communicated its, its expertise to the international community, um, to the United Nations bodies, and China's been very clear that it's a development footing first, um, a very well-worn phrase by Chinese diplomats that development is the master key um, to addressing all problems. Development is the master key to resolving global governance problems. So to see something like GSI where China's putting the security footing first and really closely linking development and security outcomes, security and development outcomes um, to achieving positive outcomes in global politics is a really, to me, a very big move. Um, and I think, again, this ability to sort of present this suite of products now, you know, the four three or four different global governance products that they have along with BRI is again, a significant move. Um, but I would say, I think, you know, we can look at GSI and think about its particular spaces that it can try and inhabit within the UN system. So of course, China will use its rotating presidency at the UN Security Council as it has the last two rounds um, to make sure that it references GSI. It tries to get language about GSI onto the formal um, UN Security Council agenda, um, publishing its, you know, its own diplomatic views now getting into UN documentation. Um, we can also see the different products that are now rehatted as GSI related. So even though the UN Peace and Development Fund, of which I know you've done a lot of research on, um, has been around since 2015, this fund is now rehatted as evidence of China's GSI contribution. So this $200 million per decade is now indicative of China's GSI vision. So I think, again, as much as we talk about the newness, and I would certainly agree about the um, potential, there is, again, this very sort of efficient rehatting and reorganizing um, and sort of repackaging of existing individual disparate initiatives as now being indicative of GSI. Now, actually, I would argue GSI might be a slightly more complicated product to try and neatly link up into the UN system. More complicated doesn't mean impossible. It just means it has to be broken down and attached to discussions on peacekeeping, attached to you know, conversations at the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. There are ways to do this, right? Um, using China's own diplomatic network and using its own diplomatic airtime. But then you have a product like the Global Development Initiative, exactly as Taylor points out, that it really does seem ready to be attached to um, the SDGs and sort of refocusing energy on the SDGs and our 
post-COVID, living with COVID time period. And so China's ability to really emphasize the very close linkage um, between the SDGs and GDI um, and its emphasis on sort of tech transfer, people to people, um, business related inputs into achieving global development. In this way, China can take a very different strategy and it has done very well, especially on the sidelines of this UNGA, we've seen the same thing where China has emphasized um, its group of friends. So this informal mechanism, this talking shop, um, I wouldn't say workshop, but it's a talking shop that keeps the, that keeps the attention, keeps the momentum moving um, on particular you know, functional issues of international politics, and China's taken up GDI. And again, it's a very, you know, well-used playbook by Beijing. You know, at one point they claimed that there was over 100 members um, within this group. So if you turned up, um, if you'd sent a representative to listen in, this now be, must be indicative of your country's interest in supporting this particular initiative. Um, the numbers will move depending which source you try and secure to try and learn from, um, depending I think where GDI is moving, but it is very important that at its high, there was you know, 100 members plus also endorsement by the UN Secretary General. Um, the Deputy Secretary General has been on the record repeatedly talking about the importance of GDI um, for achieving the SDGs. And again, we have to remember exactly as Bates points out, these aren't just words, there is funding attached to this. And that's why, again, I think there's interest and uptake to sort of working with these initiatives in the UN system. Last but not least, just to point out, these aren't products being advanced just through the multilateral system. China is also working very closely, again, trying to make sure that more of this language will move through the BRICS plus arrangement, that there are these bilateral agreements. So we've seen um, the GSI being endorsed um, by the Philippines, Syria, um, other bilateral players. So this type of language, again, trying to enact this initiative as if it's almost already been implemented. Um, and I think really trying to raise this as something possible. I would just like to note, though, that I don't want to give you the impression that this is all some type of top down orchestration without any potential pushback. Um, I think we can already see in the human rights related space, the questions being raised and sort of the, um, you know, sort of borders being sort of tightened now about permitting GCI language to move into and move through the UN Human Rights Council without any type of questioning or clarification um, to try and understand again, how these common aspirations and civilizational diversity and civilizational differences really can link up and better implement universal fundamental human rights as enshrined in the UN Charter. So again, I think to sort of emphasize that there is a healthy debate going on um, within these spaces and it's not simply the multilateral space that China is pursuing. So thanks Bates. Thank you, Courtney. I'm, I'm really glad that you made that point about how uh, already ongoing activities are going to get rebadged, uh, relabeled. That was very much the, um, the process that went underway as the BRI gained strength. Um, you know, ongoing infrastructure development projects simply were relabeled. And similarly, we're likely to see that with the GSI, GDI, possibly the GCI. Um, and secondly, um, interesting insights, you know, about how these initiatives can or cannot uh, get through the system um, where the GCI, Civilization Initiative, which is about human rights, which is about you know, acceptance of different systems of governance, um, you know, i.e. authoritarian systems, for example, um, that's going to be um, a lot more uh, controversial, I think, and sensitive, even within the United Nations. Um, whereas perhaps the GDI, you know, everyone wants to see development, um, uh, that's maybe more likely to move or be more widely accepted. And then finally, um, thanks for making the point that this isn't just about the UN. Um, we're going to be seeing these initiatives promoted, touted, um, and efforts underway to seek legitimate uh, le legitimation of these of these initiatives in virtually all of China's diplomatic engagements. And particularly, I would think we'll see them quite prominently um, um, profiled in you know, what we might call the Sinocentric multilateralism, like, uh, like the BRICS, but many, many other institutions, um, the China Arab Summit, um, uh, you know, the Forum on Cooperation, uh, China-Africa Cooperation, and many, many others where China you know, has a pretty powerful role to play in setting agendas, um, laying out uh, outcome documents and so on. 
and, and we'll be able to introduce the language and the, and the framing of these different initiatives into those, into those uh, discussions. Um, Taylor, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to get you uh, to chime in here. Um, I know you've, you've, you've spent a, a lot of time um, and are really a great expert on, the, on China's um, environmental and climate uh, policy, uh, internationally in particular. Um, and I wonder, um, how do you see this proposal now um, folding into that space? Uh, not just at the UNGA this week, um, but more, you know, how it's going to center um, uh, the global south in the UN agenda and, and in other international uh, uh, initiatives or other international engagements so it can further uh, its own climate agenda. Thank you, Bates. I think that global features in most of the initiative titles, and this is definitely no coincidence. China wants to amplify its voice on the international stage and specifically at the UN and other multilateral organizations. But in order to do that, it does need support. And what better way to do that than to tap into 152 developing countries, which includes our least developed countries, our landlocked developing countries and our vulnerable states, which are countries that are in extra need of assistance. And while China is committed to supporting and advancing the growth and development of these countries through its initiatives, China also understands that the Global South in particular is the largest and fastest growing part of the world, and that expansive investment in that area may actually reap new economic rewards in addition to garnering its greater support at the international level. And at BRICS, uh, this has mostly been seen through obviously funding that's been coming through. At BRICS, she reinforced that China set up its Global Development and South-South Cooperation Fund, which totaled $4 billion USD, and Chinese financial institutions were going to set up another $10 billion in order to further the implementation of the GDI. And this was actually echoed by Han Zhang at the high-level meeting on the GDI cooperation outcomes hosted on the sidelines of Ungi yesterday. China is centering its voice through advocacy for developing countries. And this is very much intrinsically linked with the climate agenda. Um, it appears that you know, China's rhetoric, especially on the climate front, is to push for developed countries to give developing countries greater financial commitments in the form of climate financing. Developed countries, as we know, have benefited from using fossil fuels in their economic growth and development. And being told to developing countries that they can't do the same thing means that it's time to pay up and pay support for that. So if we want to actually encourage these countries to embrace more of a renewable energy transition, but also continue to economically grow and develop, then there needs to be funds that are coming through. And one way that this is actually potentially being advocated through is through a loss and damage fund. Um, Xie Jianhua at an address actually yesterday in the Center for China and Globalization Forum stated that developed countries must meet the 2009 pledge of $100 billion in climate financing in order to give hope to these developing countries. Um, and we know that those who suffer the most from the impacts of climate change are actually the ones that contribute the least to the issue. But in saying that, when we actually read the initiatives that China has put out at the moment, um, especially the GDI, we are lacking these concrete plans. Yes, they are embodying a lot of the language that the United Nations is pushing in terms of supporting the sustainable development goals and wanting to operationalize the UNFCCC framework, but we're not quite seeing that as of yet. So a step to take forward is for China to actually operationalize how it's going to respond to adaptation and mitigation in the form of tangible action. It's not enough at this point just to have a dialogue or just to commit to having a conversation about it. We need to see the tangible action. So hopefully that takes the form of strengthening in terms of climate financing for mitigation, especially for the global south, uh, but some sort of agreement or bilateral cooperation between China and other countries in addition to the initiatives that it set out at the moment. Thanks a lot, Taylor. Um just a couple more questions for you guys, and we and we do now have some uh, questions coming in from our audience, and we will get to those in just a moment. Uh, just to follow up with you, um, Taylor, I have a question for you. Um, how do you view the linkage between China's own domestic uh, sort of agenda, you know, stability, instability, maybe some economic downturn and headwinds? Um, you know, one of our audience questioners raises the issue of the current sort of apparent, um, you know, uh, 
unusual activity at the very tip, at the very top of the um, Chinese political system in terms of disappearances and the like. I mean, I guess the question is, do you see a linkage between um, China's own domestic agenda and its own um, sensitivities and stabilities there in relation to China's international ambition? Absolutely, yes, completely. China is more likely to commit to the international agenda if it has stability at home. And we know that that is categorically true of most countries, but it's even more so important in the context of China, given how important China's action is in its commitment to achieving the international agenda. We know that China is currently struggling economically and seemingly politically, as has been pointed out. We have youth unemployment at an all-time high. We have lower GDP growth post-COVID-19 pandemic, the lifting of restrictions. And we're seeing political changes, especially at the moment with Li Shangfu and Qing Gang. So there is incentive for China to act, but only if it's able to keep on track with its domestic stability. And we have seen this relationship between domestic stability and international stability play out quite a lot, especially um, through the pandemic, but also in the Russia-Ukraine war, which I alluded to earlier in terms of energy security. So in order for China to have a stable environment, in order to commit and advance itself on the international stage, it very much needs to get its domestic stability together. Um, that's obviously out of the control in some ways of the international community and something that President Xi is going to have to work on himself. But if we do want to see further advancement, a more ambitious agenda at the international, China certainly needs to get itself together domestically. Thanks a lot, Taylor. That does touch on a couple of issues that have been raised in our Q&A function from our audience. Still encouraging our audience to please go ahead and um, write those in and we will get to them in just a moment. Last question for me, for you, uh, Courtney, um, you know, take a step or two back. Um, how do you interpret a likelihood of success? Let's call it that. What are, what are some of the factors that China is going to face that are going to support uh, this proposal's uh, agenda? And what factors would you point to that are likely to be constraints or obstacles to success? Great, no, thank you, Bates. That's the million dollar question. Um, I, I think I think there's a number of things that do facilitate, you know, China's, you know, ambitious uh, reform and development for global governance program. Um, the document released on the 13th of this month. There are a number of factors. Um, you know, we really have a international community that it actually is quite united over its dissatisfaction of the way that the United Nations is working at the moment. Um, exactly for all the cases, all the examples that Taylor pointed out, and you know, just the environmental green space alone, um, China is able to sort of join a vast majority of states that do not understand how the international system, um, through this United Nations, through the Bretton Woods institutions, why does it not seem to work for the conditions today? So I think there's a real opportunity. And we have to remember too, that the UN Secretary General himself has repeatedly called for the need to reform, for the need for the UN to sort of fit the conditions and the problems, the massive global governance issues that he sees coming. Um, again, the concern about G2 politics now working its way through the multilateral space, um, the concerns about AI, climate crisis, et cetera. So, you know, China is not on this vanguard alone. Um, senior UN officials, the most senior UN official is repeatedly on the record over the last couple of years saying that the UN itself has to get its own house in order, um, you know, really to figure out where it's going. So again, that sense of general dissatisfaction, I think is very important. Um, we also have the advantage that China has, despite it's, you know, current economic slowdown and the economic headwinds um, that both you and Taylor note. Um, China is in a leading position in terms of really trying to push these financial initiatives together and trying to push them out. Um, as much as we may, you know, debate exactly all the things that BRI has done or has not done, I think we can certainly agree that there has been no other, you know, global infrastructure or program of the same scale or of the same sort of PR focus in a way that BRI has been. So I think, again, you know, there are lessons learned from that particular initiative, you know, from those particular implementation hiccups and issues, um, blowback problems that will also help facilitate implementation, again, of the GSI, GCI, GDI, et cetera. Um, and we have to also remember that China has made these very broad, and so they're very flexible. So any type of opportunity that can be grasped 
any type of, you know, space that can be expanded into, you know, China has that ability now to try and sort of move a various number of diplomatic opportunities now to claim that these are proof and success of the GSI itself. So exactly as you know, um, it's not very clear, you know, as Taylor points out exactly how these talk shops are going to move into actual implementation for GDI for reaching these, you know, climate crisis um, counter moves. That may also not necessarily be the point. Um, so I think that those are sort of those broad trends. But I think at the same time, we have to also acknowledge that, again, as I've noted, this is not going to be um, without general pushback. Um, we really are at the point, I think one of the things to consider is that we really are at a point now where there's a much more sophisticated conversation um, about what China's doing in the multilateral system. Just the, you know, the level of conversation, the scholarship, the research coming out, um, Taylor's most recent report that everyone does have to read. Um, you know, all of this is really sort of, you know, indic indicative now at this point of the fact that there are a number of states paying very close attention to what China is doing in the multilateral system and a very flexible group of states. Um, India sometimes is in that group. Sometimes it's the like minded New Zealand, Canada, the US, UK, Australia. Um, sometimes it's even smaller players that simply just want to know exactly what China is talking about. Um, we are seeing this move now that there are a number of states being willing to sort of cast that diplomatic chit and actually push back. And this may be something as small as rejecting language. Um, it may be as something small as sort of holding up a vote. But this, again, is indicative that there are states that aren't necessarily moving along with you know, the direction that China is advancing with this by states, for states approach to global governance problems. And I'd also like to point out, you know, I think it is very important um, that China is still on the back foot, I would argue. Um, if we look at the examples of the way that the initial GSI output um, in April of last year, phrase GSI, it came across as a very defensive, um, I'd argue reactive emphasis on regime security document, um, really sort of trying to find space for China as much as there was a lot of global criticism for the way that China was handling the Ukraine war. Um, and I think we have to remember again that, you know, there is potential for these types of pushbacks to occur and that China has to be, you know, putting its best foot forward in terms of flexible, elegant diplomacy that allows it to try and thread a very thin needle. Um, that there are, again, these hardline um, domestic issues that China still has to face first and that sort of wariness um, about the way that its own domestic and international reputation can be affected on the international stage. So I think, again, just to be cautious that we sort of don't forget that these documents aren't um, always so top down and they aren't always so easy to execute and they are reflective of moments and shifts um, within global conversation. And so I think there'll be potential opportunities, certainly for pushback and for the seeking of greater clarification and, you know, pushing China. If you say the say, you talk the talk, well, what exactly are you doing to implement? Can you clarify, for example, how achieving common security or achieving legitimate security concerns? What does this mean for collective security? And really trying to get that clarification. You know, if you talk about common aspirations, how does this match with really having respect for fundamental universal human rights as respected in the UN Charter. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be, again, part of that sticking point when we move away from these talking points. Um, exactly as Taylor notes, how do we actually move into implementation? And I think that's where sort of the question marks still remain. Well, that, that's a good segue, Courtney, I think, to some of the questions that we have from our audience. I think I could summarize them uh, just basically um, asking the question, you know, how does China then square, um, you know, much of the, let's say, often unwelcome or in some, in some countries' perceptions, um, uh, uh, you know, yeah, unwelcome aspects of its governance system, um, some of the faults and vulnerabilities that we've now seen emerging more, uh, more prominently over the past year or two, how do they square that with this very ambitious global agenda that they wish to lead? Um, one of our questioners asks, um, how do the recent disappearances of Chinese ministers, for example, um, you know, Li Shangfu and Qing Gang, um, you know, how does that impact its image and its effort to try and put forward a viable narrative? Um, another, another questioner asks, you know, if these initiatives are so important um, and, and China wants to push this forward, why wasn't Xi Jinping himself um, at the rostrum 
uh, at, at the UN General Assembly uh, rather than his vice president, Han Zheng. Um, and then, you know, another question that's related, I think, um, and feel free to pick any one of these you'd like in, in the remaining time we have. Um, you know, how much attraction does the GDI, GSI, GCI, the Data Security Initiative, how much attraction do they have really as an alternative to the Western-led rules-based order, or are they simply a kind of smorgasbord that maybe some countries will pick from, uh, depending on their own personal uh, interests uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and maybe values? Um, or do we think, do you think, uh, that what's being proposed here, in fact, is meant to replace the current rules-based, you know, what's often termed the liberal rules-based order? Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, let me start with you, Taylor, and then turn it over to Courtney. Thank you, Bates, and thank you very much for the questions. I think it's an interesting question as to why President Xi is not at UNGA, uh, and it's a question that I've been asked a lot over the past few days. I don't think anybody's really going to know the answer to that apart from Xi himself. However, I think in my personal opinion, it's because domestic stability is in flux at the moment, and he knows that the place that he needs to be in right now is in China addressing these concerns. Um, I will also note that not every head of state is currently representing their country at UNGA. Um, there are representatives of different countries of all different levels within ministries that are currently either sitting in the UNGA hall or they're currently at site events. And it really just depends on how an individual country wants to place the representatives that it comes with. Um, however, what I would like to reinforce is that in terms of stability, President Xi needs to, to be back in China at this particular point in time, given the flux that is currently happening because of that relationship that I was emphasizing before in terms of domestic stability with its international stability. So for President Xi right now, his concern is to ensure the stability of China domestically, to reinforce its party legitimacy, and then from that be able to ensure that its international stability is just as strong. Um, but what I will say is that potentially President Xi's absence is also a comment on Xi being very confident in the strength of the initiatives that he has posed. And he is quite happy for representatives like Han Zheng in order to advocate effectively on those. Um, in relation to whether or not, just on the other question, if these initiatives from China are going to replace a world order, I don't personally think that they are going to replace it, rather want to challenge the world order and establish a multipolar world order, which then would actually give greater stability to the international community from China's perspective. So I'll pass it back to Bates. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Taylor. A great, great summation of those issues. And um, Courtney, do you have some thoughts on the questions the audience posed? Um, I definitely do. And some thoughts, I, certainly in conversation with Taylor's comments. Um, I, I think, you know, Taylor's exactly on the money here that, um, you know, we have to look at it in context. President Biden was the only head of state to come out of the permanent members of the UN Security Council. So China's certainly not in the minority at this point um, by not having President Xi arrive. I, I think, again, we're also you know, we're in a very different phase. I cannot emphasize enough, this document is talking about idea to action, vision to reality, a decade of BRI, a decade of community of common destiny. Um, I would take it as a signal um, in confidence now that China is sort of in the rollout phase. It's not in the big ideas phase in the way that his huge speech in 2015 um, with, you know, the verbal commitment of a billion dollar um, global peace and development fund, where that was sort of really something that, you know, really snapped attention for many, many people to realize that China has arrived and will have ideas and input. Um, so I would take it almost as a sign of confidence, um, my own personal interpretation that, you know, President Xi himself does not have to be there to manage and to sort of set the tone. Um, they now are moving into a new phase of their own global engagement. Um, I think I have a slightly different perspective um, to Lyle's question about whether or not these are, are alternative products. Um, I think, again, they are in the sense that these are very clear signals that China is not interested um, in certain aspects that are normally hatted under um, the rules-based international order, the Western liberal order. Um, again, this centrality, at least in understanding, you're meant to be respecting and supporting universal human rights, which of course we all know in practice, many states 
practically all states are going to find ways to fudge and sort of work the margins about what those definitions mean in their own particular national interests. Um, that said, I do think it's important that China, while it has been building parallel institutions, AIIB, BRICS plus, et cetera, um, China is very clear that the United Nations is the focal point. It is the foundation for the global governance system for international politics, you know, the reference to the UN Charter as this touchstone foundational document. So I think it is, again, very important, this attempt to seek reform from within and the ability to meld and bind these products um, into the existing UN strata. So exactly that, you know, SDGs are the common lingua franca for how we think about and obtain and move forward on development. The fact that GDI is now being touted by senior UN officials as one mechanism to try and achieve certain SDG goals by 2030. So I think, again, we're really thinking about modifying any sense of this rules-based international order, if we can agree what that is and if it's fixed in time, um, modifying it from within. But I think, again, it's important to note that you don't need to have every single 190 something states agreeing with you in order to try and seek change. Um, and there is an amenable audience that is disgruntled. Um, Taylor has named quite a few groups already in the green environment space that do feel like the system isn't working. And these states are the first states that will have a little bit more time um, and maybe a little less pushback on the ideas and the products that Beijing itself is now advancing. And I think that those are the receptive audience members. The real question is going to be whether or not states that have had a more um, traditional, um, more have, have more traditionally approved and sort of supported um, this rules-based international order, what their engagement and what their participation will be on these particular GDI, GCI questions. I think one other thing that we should also be paying attention to is the cross application. Um, so we can see again that China has referenced, you know, bilateral sanctions, um, concerns about sanctions in GSI. Now that's being also played out into this GDI space. And so again, for example, the way that Chinese officials, you know, even the head of the Food and Agricultural Organization has discussed whether or not sanctions um, against Russia have actually made bigger problems for the global food aid crisis. So I think that sort of um, tying together the security and development language, I think that's certainly something that we need to pay attention to and not sort of fall into these silos of just there's development, there's security and there's human rights. And um, there's certainly evidence now that China's trying to link and combine. Um, and I, I think that's something that we should be paying attention to as the margins of interest shift on these particular initiatives in various fora. Thanks. Well, thanks so much, Courtney and Taylor. Uh, certainly not the last word on this. And as we've all noted, uh, we should be keeping our eyes on these developments because this is an important proposal not to be readily dismissed. Uh, and we're gonna be hearing a lot more from China across all of these various initiatives and plans uh, to provide alternatives, if not a full alternative, uh, but certainly provide alternatives. And there's going to be a receptive audience out there uh, uh, across, across the globe. Um, it's been a great pleasure as the executive director of the Center for China Analysis with the ASPE, uh, with the Asia Society Policy Institute to be able to host this to have these two great speakers. Let me encourage everybody out there who's still listening to please come visit us, uh, the Center for China Analysis website. Uh, there's a very prominent place there where you can subscribe uh, to, uh, to hear more uh, from us. Uh, so you'd be notified about these sorts of activities and to begin receiving uh, our new uh, weekly newsletter called the China Five, which is gonna keep you up to date on the most important recent developments in relation to China, uh, curated and, uh, and, and analyzed by by our own team uh, using our inside out approach to understanding what's going on in China and what it means for the world. Encourage all of you to have a look at that. Uh, with that, let me uh, thank you all once again for joining us from around the world. We're very grateful for your kind attention and support and we look forward to having you join us at a future event. Uh, it just leaves it to me now to once again, thank our speakers uh, Dr. Courtney Fung, who is scholar in residence at the Asia Society Australia and associate professor at Macquarie University in Sydney, and Taylor Bland, who is the Schwartzman Fellow with the Center for China Analysis in the Asia Society Policy Institute. Thanks very much, Courtney. 